we're live. <laughs> Woohoo! Welcome to yet another edition of PCS Impact q and I'm your host, Jay Boyce. I'm the Director of Community Outreach at PCS Grades. Boom! <laughs> With me, as always, is the lovely Megan Harless, our resident PCS reform advocate, and oh, by the way, resident BA censored for little ears in your room because we love you. We've got a great show for you today, a must see show. And the reason for that is because we're talking about PCS regulations. Okay. Megan here is going to break it down, Barney style, for all of us. Why? Why do we even need to know this? All right. Let's say you're having some PCS issues and somebody says to you, show me where in the regulations it says that. You're going to be like, mic drop once we're done with you. And of course, you know, as we go over this stuff, it might be a lot to digest, but that's why we've got the replay button. Isn't that awesome? You can hit pause, you can hit replay. And of course, this thing lives on Facebook and YouTube, um, so you can reference it later on. But either way, Megan and I are going to prepare you for your next PCS to make sure that nobody says to you, show me the regulations, without you being able to be like, boom. So... Before we get to Megan and those DOD updates and start going down those correct questions and the regulations, I'm going to go through those housekeeping items really quick as we do every week. Ready, set, here we go. All right, folks, we've got the answers. And if we don't have the answers, guess what? We know who does. And if we don't know either of those things, we're going to take your questions for action and get back to you with an answer. Speaking of questions, comments, concerns, Shout outs. Go ahead and leave those in the comment section below and we'll make sure to uh, enter you to win some very awesome Hope Design bling. Yes, questions, comments, concerns, drop them right down there because the more you engage, the more chances that you have to win. And since it's Military Appreciation Month, we're kind of going a little bit bigger to show our mill spouse love. Y'all ready? All right. Next up, we bring the experts to you. Experts like U.S. Transportation Command, experts like military movers, experts like education advocates and military spouse employment advocates. We bring these experts to you so that you can ask the source. But sometimes you're going to run into an issue that is specific to you and your military family. And in those specific instances, there will be two, two forever and always resources. Number one, your local chain of command. Number two, your local transportation office. Those are the people who know you. Those are the people who are dealing with your stuff. Those are the people who could take your issues and further them for action. And of course, you always have PCS grades as well as a resource, whether you want to leave or read a review for your on or off base housing, your movers, schools, and so much more. Head on over to PCS grades, but wait till the end. We've got a great show for you today. Last but certainly not least, and I'm going to have to modify this in the future, pleasantly surprising, but... Let's continue to do our part, people. I'm very proud of everyone. Let's continue to do our part to flatten that curve. Restrictions are being lifted. Everything is, is you know, whether you're in an area that still has masks or has lifted it, do your part depending on your area. Remember, your movers are still required to wear those masks and follow guidance that the DOD places on them. Megan said it before, and she will probably reiterate at some point as well. But the bottom line is make sure that they're wearing their masks because they can get in trouble otherwise. Guess what, people? We are flattening this curve, and we are flattening Murphy with it. And just in time for peak PCS season. So hallelujah. Anyways, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Megan for those DOD updates. Megan? Hey, everybody. So just a few things for you today. We know pet shipping expenses are a huge expense for military families, a huge issue, a huge concern, especially for those that are going to and from an Oconus location. Uh, just recently, I believe yesterday, or it might've been the day before, but this week, the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, no, Air Force Relief Society, pardon me, my bad y'all, Air Force Relief Society has announced that they are offering a grant for military families um, for their Air Force folks to get them uh, their pets overseas. It's a grant of up to $1,000 to help with those shipping expenses. And uh, you'll have to go visit your local Air Force Relief Society chapter, location, office, um, and go through the process with them um, for that. But a good thing for to help our military families, um, additionally, the SPCA is also giving out their military grants as well to help um, with the pet shipping expenses. 
Uh, so another great resource to go look at because we know pet shipping expenses right now are, are kind of off the charts. Uh, commercial airlines have really limited the number that they have. Patriot Express, um, while they have increased the number of pet spaces they are having in cabin, they've gone from 10 pet spaces to 20 pet spaces in a cabin. It's still limited on trying to get a seat on the Patriot Express. So uh, the Air Force Relief Society and SPCA is two great resources to kind of help you uh, with that process of getting your pets to and from an Oconus location. The last thing I have is about the seven day spread window. We talk about this frequently, but I heard from several spouses this week of being given wrong information um, from their local offices. Uh, it is not a 14 day spread window. It's not seven days on either day of your requested pickup date. It is only seven days and your requested pickup date is day one of that spread. Now, if you're transportation service provider, your TSP reaches out to you, sends you an email, says, hey, we're, we're going to pick you up on this date. And that day is not in that seven day spread. Push back on them. Tell them, no, this is your requested day. This is what your spread window is. And they need to pick up within there. If you're having issues with that requested pickup day or that agreed upon pickup day, note, uh, reach out to your local transportation office or reach out to us here. We're here happy to help you help, you know, reach out through our contacts to help make sure that folks are getting the correct information and that our moving companies are following the regulations that they need to be following. So if you got questions, please ask, happy to help. But that's all I've got for now. Send it back to you, MJ. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. And remember, people, Megan goes down that policy rabbit hole so that we don't have to. She is the guru. She breaks it down in digestible pieces for people like you and people like myself. Yes, you're right. All right. So let's just kind of dive right in. So we're talking about regulations today, and these regulations are extremely important. You might not think that you need them, but guess what? You're going to come across an issue. You are. Write it down. Make it a hashtag. I said it, you're gonna come across issues where you're going to need to know at least one of these regulations. So you can thank Megan and well, and myself for helping to facilitate Megan on this particular issue. You can thank us for giving it to you live and in real time so that you can drop it like it's hot. All right, Megan, you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it, okay. So first up, what are all of these particular, what are the particular regulations that these people, that everyone needs to know about right now like let's let's dive deep into these particular regulations so there are several that you need to know the first one is the dtr part for appendix b so this regulation the appendix b part is the tender of service which is basically the contract between the military company and the government and all these regulations i say here in this first question we're going to drop the links to those in the comments so that way you guys can easily go back and reference them. But Appendix B is basically the contract between the military, uh, the moving company and the military. The next one you need to know is the DTR Part 4 Attachment K1. Um, that one is known as the It's Your Move document. You will hear a lot of the local transportation offices say, hey, you need to read the It's Your Move piece. Um, that basically outlines the responsibilities of you and your TSP and some other information that you as a customer should be aware of. Uh, the third one you need to know is the JTR Chapter 5. Uh, that one is um, uh, the basically the financial entitlements to your uh, um to, to everything that you have, uh, you know, it outlines your, your per diem, your DLA, your TLE, but all of your basically financial entitlements are going to be found in the JTR chapter five. And then you have the claim liability business rules um, that basically outlines all of your stuff dealing with your claims. So if you need to know how a claim should be handled, if you have a mold claim, whatever it may be, the claim liability business rules are is what you're going to be referencing the last thing you need to know about is the dtmo the defense travel management office um, this one is basically again your financial entitlements but from the military side so if you need like a per diem calculator you go to the dtmo page um, and input what you got and it'll give you your estimation um, you need to figure out your travel days how many authorized travel days you're going to have between locations the dtmo office um, website is also the place you go to kind of find that on as well. All right. 
So here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I kind of understand what you say, but let's let's just go ahead and break it down a little bit further, just specifically because you know we love our acronyms, because that's a thing. Can you just a lot of folks are gonna be confused between DTR and JTR. Okay, so can you please explain the difference between them and and you know just dive a little bit into that? And that's important because we need to know which one to search in for what thing. So can you explain that to our peeps? Of course. So DTR is defense travel regulation. The JTR is joint travel regulation. So JTR, the joint travel regulation, again, is your financial entitlements. So anything um, that is like all of your entitlements for moving your DLA per diem, uh, if you have to do a split move or anything like that, that is where you're going to go look for those things is in the JTR. The DTR, think physical movement of your household goods. How are my things going to be moved? How should they be packed? How should they be created? What paperwork do I need from the moving company? You're going to find that stuff in the DTR, the defense travel regulation. So think of them as they they complement each other, but they're two different things. So if you need stuff about finance, you need to look in the JTR. If you need to know how your stuff is going to physically move, look in the DTR. And am I not mistaken that sometimes you will find info regarding your question in both. In both, and they usually do a a good job at referencing um, where to find it at in the the other regulation. Okay, okay, so I'll be looking up this, I'll be looking up toys, just an example, because I know nothing. I'll be looking up toys in the JTR, and it'll be like, okay, and for more information referencing this exact thing, Mm -hmm. toys, you can also look in the DTR. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay, cool. Love it. All right. See, we're breaking it down one piece at a time. All right. Here's a controversial question because I wouldn't be me if it wasn't. Um, so this one's about pro gear and then spouse pro gear, because that is a thing people. Mm-hmm. What actually qualifies for pro gear and where do you find that info? So pro gear for the service member is generally going to be those items that they use for their job. So anything that they're basically issued from CIF or the military can be counted as pro gear. If they have some specialty job, like they may be a welder or a doctor or anything like that, and they have specific equipment to their job that can be included in pro gear as well. For spouse pro gear, it is anything that relates to the job you have now, the job you're going to. And it can also be things that that you use for community involvement. So if you volunteer a lot and you have various different things, you can include some of that stuff into your spouse pro gear as well. Now, the thing to know about all of this pro gear, so service members are allowed up to 2,000 pounds. Spouses are allowed up to 500 pounds. You find information about pro gear in two places. The first one is this, it is the DTR part four attachment K1 and on pages nine to 10. And then you can also find more information in the JTR chapter five and paragraph 054309. So those two places will tell you more about your pro gear. Now I will say in regards to spouse pro gear, they are getting really particular on what it is that you can claim in regards to spouse pro gear. Um, you know, a big question we have a lot, you know, is like, if you're a homeschooling mom, you know, you have a lot of curriculum um, for that. However, it's not counted as spouse pro gear. If you do have a, t- a teaching certification, you can use that um, to get some of that stuff counted as spouse pro gear. But if you do not, then unfortunately, it does not um, count as spouse pro gear. So, but you can find more information right here, as we said, in the JTR chapter five, and then also in the DTR part four attachment K one. Okay. And Dustin has a question about this. Um, maybe if, okay. Shout out Dustin. Oh, see, I mean, it already totally answered it, but if I'm a homeschool mom, cause this was a thing. Remember we were talking about this mm-hmm. teaching yeah. would be my teaching materials via pro gear. Mm-hmm. Because that's a, that's a new thing. That's a new thing that not just before, it was a question. Well, now with everybody this past year having had to do that for so long, mm-hmm. is this a thing? It, it, you know, we, we've asked the services about this frequently, about, you know, because a lot of folks have pivoted to homeschooling or virtual learning. 
Um, you know, and now we have different equipment than what we used to have pre COVID, you know, how does this impact with spouse pro gear and with our weights, I will tell you the services have been looking at it. Um, they've been reviewing it, but there's been no determination made on it currently. Um, but we hear from a lot of a lot of folks that, that share those same concerns that are homeschool moms, homeschool dads, and they have, you know, bookshelves of curriculum, uh, you know, and wanting to have it count as as pro gear because that that is their job. Their job is teaching their children. And it's a very, you know, uh, legit concern that a lot of folks have. And, and we hear you, our services, Transcom hear you. Um, but currently it, it's not included in it. And it's hopefully something that we can change, uh, hopefully within the next year or so. Well, absolutely. Especially since many families made that pivot and yeah. decided to stay in that pivot for one reason or another. And, yeah. and props, by the way, if that's you. Um, but if I'm a homeschool mom, and still had my hair. Um, no, I'm just kidding. If I'm a homeschool mom and that was my jam and that's what I, you know, focused on, would I, if I considered it pro gear and I said, I am a teacher, are they gonna be like, let me see your credentials, let me see your shirts, let me see this, let me see that? Like, is that a thing? Are you there? I am. My sound went out for a minute. You were talking oh. and then you stopped talking. And you oh, were still sorry. talking. Sorry. So okay, yes. what you said. okay, so basically, if I if I say I am a teacher, do I have to prove to my moving company that I have credentials as a teacher to consider that pro gear? Uh, some will ask for it. And it's not just your TSP. It's the local transportation offices as well. Um, that when you go through your move and you set your move up on DPS, there's questions in there asking about, you know, do you have pro gear that you're claiming? Do you have spouse pro gear that you're claiming? You check those boxes, yes, and you have to list what it is you're claiming. Um, it has to be approved by your local transportation office to be counted as your pro gear. Um, so for some of those things, you know, saying that I'm a teacher, they may say, do you have a teaching cer certification? Or you may have to show and prove that, you know, you do have a teaching certification. Um, you know, do you have a, whichever it may be, you may have to show that, you know, yes, I have uh, a license for that type of career or whatever it may be, um, you know, to, to get your, your pro gear that you're claiming to be authorized. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dustin, for that question. I know you kind of, we kind of answered it, but I, we've had that question asked many times. And again, due to COVID, it, it's kind of conflicting, you know, like I myself, I have, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I have a background in training, for instance, like not like not like physical training, y'all, I wish. Um, but more like, you know, I, I cater to the adult learner and I facilitate courses that are that deal with soft skills and different things like that when it comes to adults. So I have numerous binders, books, blah, 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 blah. And I do have certs that I could probably pull out if I could find them from the previous move um, to show. But, I, you know, that, that would have been helpful last move, move before that, you know, the drill. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So we answered that question on, on the whole pro gear thing. Okay. So let's, let's, let's pivot to one of the bigger changes this year. There, one of the bigger changes this year that was affected. Oh, by the way, four days ago, it was effective. Um, is that this is the seals on crates again, right? So where can I find out what is required regarding these seals? So the place that you're going to look at is going to be the DTR part four Appendix B, page 26. So we had a few years where seals were not required on shipments, but they came back into play as of Saturday, May 15th. So if your shipment is serviced after May 15th, this applies to you. Um, seals should be placed on the crates in front of you, and the crating should be happening at your home. Now, you can authorize um, you know, crating and the seals being applied at the warehouse, but that's upon your approval to do that. There may be some instances where, you know, a truck may be broke down or, you know, you, uh, you know, you, and they're asking you to wait an extra day or two to get a crated truck there, but you just can't because of your timeline, you need your stuff out. Um, you know, so you may say, you know, crate at the warehouse is fine kind of deal. Um, but crating should be happening at your residence and the seals should be applying should be applied to your crates in front of you at your residence so you can find the language for all of that in the dtr part four appendix b which is their tender of service and specifically on page 26. and i think i remember so last week we had transfer u.s transportation come on mm -hmm. 
command, come on, Mr. Rick Marsh, shout out. Um, and he was awesome because that kind of question came up a couple times. And, you know, somebody did make that question, did ask the question, you know, what happens if they say, you know, that they have to do it at the warehouse, it's, that it's, you know, it's it's got to be done there. And he said, you know, if you have questions, if it's, you really should qual call your QA or quality assurance, um, quality assurance inspector. inspector. Thank you, Megan. Uh, see this? See? One team, one fight. Um, so he really said, like, if you are that unsure and if you're like, no, I'm showing you the regs, you've got to do it here. And you just are not. QA will help you out. And you should be assigned one of those, correct? Right off the bat and at least have a number to call. Yeah. So you got two different people that you can call. So the first one's going to be your move coordinator from your TSP transportation service pro provider. That is the person that's assigned to you from the moving company that if you have questions, concerns such as this and creating um, at your residence, you can call them and ask them. On the military side, you have the QA inspector. Um, they come from your local transportation office. Now, you may not have a phone number directly to the QA inspector, but you should have on hand the number to the local office. So you can call the local office, tell them what the issue is, and then they'll send QA inspectors out to your home as needed. Word. Um, and Stacy Vance had this question. Shout out, Stacy. Um, okay, and this is pertinent. Will they move any cleaners or bath stuff if it's new and sealed for Oconus? We are waiting on hard orders, so no guidance from the moving company yet. So it's good that she's hitting us up now before those hard orders take effect. Yeah, so generally, the general rule of thumb is that if it's a liquid, if it's flammable, um, batteries, light bulbs, uh, candles that can melt and lose shape generally is not packed um, at all. So in regards to your bath stuff, the cleaners I'll probably say will not get packed. Um, your bath stuff, if it's like lotions and shampoo, I generally have seen those get packed without issue. My recommendation is that you should always go ahead and like put them in Ziploc bags um, just to ensure if something sure to, were to bust, it's contained in a Ziploc bag and not all over everything else in the box. Um, but, but your cleaners will probably not go as depending what's in them could be flammable. Your bath stuff should be okay. All right. Ooh. Okay. I clicked and it, you guys are just hitting it and quitting it. I love this. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Oh my God. I love all these questions. Okay. So Dustin, um, what if it's after hours? And I'm assuming that she means what we were previously talking about. So calling the QA, hey, you know, like they tell you last minute after hours, hey, we're not creating your stuff here. We're doing it at the warehouse. Where can she call then? Um, so if it's after hours, like on a weekend, your TSP now has to provide customer support um, from eight to five. So if it's on a weekend, you've still got somebody there that you can contact. If it is after hours, like after 5 p.m. kind of deal or happening on a Sunday sort of issue, um, each of the services has an, their own number that you can call that can be found on move.mil under the customer service tab. You scroll down, it'll say, you know, service branch help desk and it'll list all the branches there. There is also on that same page, go just underneath of where it lists all the different services, there is the transcom hotline number. Um, I will say some of these numbers, um, it, they give you places where you can call and have your issue and your concern and whatever is happening documented. They may not be able to directly help you right at that moment, um, but they take your information, they send it to whoever it is that can help you, and then hopefully within 24 hours, you get a call back from somebody that can, uh, can assist you there. Got you. And I feel like this one needs to be addressed because we're still real here. Like we provide the resources and we have our contacts and work well with our peeps at U.S. Transportation Command and the military moving association or the moving associations to kind of help facilitate this and put your word out on the street. But Mary, she had an interesting thing happen. We had a QA flat out lie to their boss regarding our concerns and proved it out later on. But in the moment, it did nothing. And I would just like to say that Megan is probably going to reiterate what I'm about to say, but I'm throwing it out there anyways. You receive a customer survey after the fact. And at that point, we are surveyed out often. But the fact of the matter is your voice matters. All of these regulations that are changing are for the benefit of the military families. And people like Megan and myself, we make sure that Megan is on the um, U.S. Transportation Command Advisory Board. And she's the one telling your story. But those survey results are what help 
power the story that she's telling from our military community. Am I correct, Megan? Absolutely. So on DPS, with every shipment, there is a customer service satisfaction survey, which is the one that MJ is referencing. Um, you get reminders to fill the survey out frequently after your move is completed. Um, but your responses to those surveys, senior members of the military, senior members of Transcom, they do read them. They do reach out frequently to customers to find out, you know, more more clarification on what it is that what their experience was to see how they can help and help rectify the situation. And that also goes into, you know, the different changes that we we put into play each year. Uh, you know, so so filling out those surveys and providing your feedback in that capacity does go a long way into the changes we make, how uh, other shipments get contracted out to that specific company. Um, you know, if, if you have an issue with somebody at a local transportation office, there's a place where you can put those comments in as well. Um, you know, and the services follow up and they they actually they, they take to heart what it is that you say and the feedback that you provide. But it goes a long way in improving what we do every year. Word. What she said, people. And honestly, it it's hard when we when we live in a very institution when we're we're part of the military we think that nobody's listening let me tell you people they listen and megan and i are we are very much in partnership with a lot of these people we are very much in helping to facilitate that conversation but we are also very much in holding those accountable we are also very much in not throwing softball questions we take people to task and and they are very receptive thus far. Um, all right, so we have a lot of questions, a lot of engagement. I promise you we're gonna answer your questions. We'll probably get to them at the tail end just in case we answer them throughout. So Megan, next question. Um, let's talk high value inventory. And we've discussed high value inventory over time several times. Um, you know, we've talked about my husband's little video game collection, vintage video games, because I'm married to a 12 year old, shout out boo. Um, but let's talk that high value inventory. Some companies give you the form to fill out, right? Others says it's, you know, it's, it's some crazy thing, like only anything over a thousand dollars can be, you know, can be put on the high value inventory. Um, okay, what actually goes on it? And where do I find it? Yeah, so the first place where you're going to look at finding it is this right here, the claim liability business rules and specifically page 13 is where it listed out. So your high value uh, inventory is generally anything that is $100 per pound or more, your antiques, uh, your high value collection. So for my family, we have a extensive sports memorabilia collection that we put on our high value items. I have a lot of Polish pottery and crystal that goes on there. So your china, your crystal um, can go on there. Um, generally anything such as that can go on your high value inventory. We do hear times the company saying, you know, like it's only this crazy amount, you know, anything that's $5,000 or more, which is completely wrong and false. Um, you know, but I always like knowing where you can find the information, what it lists out as what can be considered high value uh, items, your electronics can be included in there as well. Um, because push come to shove, like you can always pull out the regulations and say, here are the regulations. So these items over in this corner do fit what's here in the regulation, they are going on the high value inventory. Okay, and so just to just for a little clarification purposes, Dustin, shout out, girl, you're on fire. We've been told certain things can't go on it, but I made it go on the list anyway, the last move. Here's the thing about that. That's why we're doing this webinar right now, mm -hmm. so that you can literally go back and, um, Megan, if you could, so claim liability business rules page mm -hmm. 13. When they say, oh, no, it's got to be this way, you could be like, no, here's a mic drop. And the regulations come at me, bro. D don't say that part. Don't say that part. Just be like, here are the regulations. I believe you are mistaken. But Megan, mm -hmm. what would someone like Dustin do if she was told you can't do that? Um. So again, I, I kindly remind them of what the regulations are. Pull it out. Show them. Explain to them that you know it's a gov it's a government military move, and these are the regulations provided by the government um, that the, their company agrees to when they accept taking our shipment. Um, you know, there may be times when you will not be able to diffuse the situation with those folks that are on the ground with you. And that's when you call your your move coordinator from your TSP 
or your local transportation office. And at what point in the process would you do that? So when you have high value items, uh, you should let them know day one when they show up. Um, also, when you have your uh, move survey, when they come see how much stuff you have, um, let them know then as well. Um, we have a lot of high value items. So we usually end up with two inventory sheets of that. Um, I have a lot of crystal and bullish pottery and stuff. Um, <laughs> so we usually end up with two, with two inventory forms for that. Um, but notify them day one. Um, so then that way they know a lot of times they give you the form and you can fill it out yourself. Sometimes they are sticklers and their person has to do it. Um, so I sit when it's that case, I sit down next to them at my dining room table and I tell them what to write on it. You know, that it's a Polish pottery, 14 inch round, uh, bowl. Um, you know, and I give them the manufacturer of it and the value of it to put on it. Um, you know, so you really need to identify it up front. Um, don't let your home be packed and then be like, oh, where's my high value stuff? Uh, they need to know about up front. Those boxes do get marked with the seals that you have to sign that go on them. Um, you know, the tamper evidence seals sort of deal. And then, yeah, just notify them up front. That makes sense. And, you know, Andrea, Andrea has a, a, an interesting question, which is totally valid. Um, so she had said that, you know, we were told only items over 2000 total. She was, she was given the run around too. you know, told only items over 2000 total. Um, mm -hmm. she was told, you know, she, she mentioned the whole, she said $100 a pound and they said that was wrong. And then they didn't use the high value stickers. They said, they said the high value doesn't matter and they didn't use the high value stickers. So why does high value matter? So it matters for several things. So the first thing is that it gives you the ability to specifically list something on the inventory that you own. So as we know, our general inventory with like our boxes, it's their generic type of descriptions. It's a box that says, you know, linens, bed sheets, towels, washcloths sort of deal. It's a box that says, you know, boots, hats, whatever kind of deal. Uh, but your high value inventory gives you the ability to specifically list things on the inventory. So say, you know, my china, my fine china, my Polish pottery is just packed in a box and it's just labeled dishes. Uh, you know, then the onus is on me to prove what kind of dishes I had in that box, if it should go missing, um, you know, kind of deal. And having it listed specifically on a high value inventory means I don't have to do that because it's already on on a document that is that uh, like binding contract that they are accepting that those items are in my shipment. So if something happens, I don't have to go through the process of trying to say they weren't regular Walmart dishes. Don't give me the five ninety nine per plate sort of deal. It was my fine china that is one hundred and twenty five dollars per four piece place setting. Um, so that's that's really the, the the biggest thing is that it gives you that ability to specifically list things. The other thing is that. When it's a high value item, that item gets broken or that box goes missing, generally those claims, in my experience, um, get pushed through a little bit quicker because they are high value items and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, the customer is rectified, made whole because of those high value items that might have been broken or gone, down, uh, gone missing. And, you know, that and 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 that makes total sense. So. And, and just in line, and you know what, honestly, Mary, that's a great question because, and we'll bring up my vintage video games, well, my husband's anyways, because, you know, again, 12. Um, so our custom furniture piece is high value. And, you know, it was made in Europe of reclaimed wood. There's nothing I can re use to replace here in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, they can totally be put on there as, as high value items. I'll say anything like that that you have custom made, always keep your um, your receipt, your invoice, whatever it was that specifically lists what the item was that was made and what it was made of. Um, so that way, if you do have to file a claim that your company isn't trying to give you something generic off a of Walmart that looks very similar because of the way it's distressed kind of deal, um, but you have it, you know, specifically stated what it is and what the materials is that it was made. But um, yeah, custom made furniture, antique furniture that can go on your high value item, your high value. And what, what about furniture. something that doesn't have a price? Like, okay, let's talk about my husband's vintage video games. When you bought Super Mario Brothers way back in 1980, what? You know, like 
it probably isn't this <laughs> it probably isn't worth the same it's probably worth a little bit more ish right right now how how would you even go about listing that and and you know what i mean in terms of definition you've got sentimental and you've got actual high value you know would i have to like go research online and look on ebay and see how many people are like blasting this particular game out because it's worth so much right now yeah for those things i always say get an appraisal done um having an appraisal i mean antique furniture you could find something very similar to my grandma's hutch that i have from a big box store for very cheap but it's not going to be the same because of you know the, be the sizing of it the material the finish of it um, but it's antique it was built in the 50s it's a very solid wood piece of furniture um, you know so i get appraisals done on on various things that we have um, just because it's hard to to kind of you know replace it with something that's newer so speaking of the vintage video games i mean that there is a market out there for vintage video games there is a market out, there's a market for everything folks um you know so i always say get an appraisal done find somebody that can specialize that specializes or has good knowledge of that market for whatever item it is that you have and get an appraisal from them because should something happen it gives you a value and they're not just you know finding you know bob on facebook marketplace selling <laughs> The Mario game for five bucks and giving you that, and then the Mario game doesn't really work because there was a you know they didn't blow in it hard enough to clean it out because of the dust that's built up in there as we did as seven year old kids in my living room, um, you know. So have an appraisal done. Um, it, it is depending on what you have. It does cost some money to do, but should you ever need it, you'll be thankful you spent the money for it. Right. But what about those items like for Angela Atwood, you know, and I have these and I'm sure you have these too. What about something like that? My late grandma's jacket that she made by hand and won a blue ribbon for like that. You can't put a price on that. Maybe you can like guesstimate and like look at, you know, like what is that antiques roadshow? Like watch a couple mm -hmm. episodes of that. Like what are we supposed to do? So those, those things get a little bit into a, a sticky situation because they can't be replaced. Um, they are sentimental, but there isn't a good value you can put on them. Um, it, it gets a little iffy with, with what it is that, that you want to do and what you're comfortable with. So some of those things I always say if you have the space to take with you um, in your suitcase, in your car, whatever it may be to do that. I have a friend that every PCS, they rent a small, like one of those mini U-Haul trailers that they can easily uh, pull with their car, um, you know, that they put those sentimental things in that they just don't want to worry about the moving company take, um, you know, so I know some folks do that. Uh, there are some things that can, that don't fit the criteria of going on a high value inventory, but I ask that they get packed in the high value box, um, just so that way I know where they're at when they're getting packed and that I know there's, you know, it's going to be secured. Nobody want, no company wants to pay a high value claim. Um, so some of those things, you know, I'll say, Hey, can you pack this item in that box with the high value items? Um, knowing that it's not going on the high value inventory, but I, for me, it's a little bit more of a peace of mind knowing it's in the box with the high value inventory items that's specifically listed. Um, that box usually shows up without issue because nobody wants to pay that claim that makes sense um and in angela you know like you're asking questions that thousands of military families have asked in the past so you're not wrong no none of these questions are dumb the only question that's dumb is the one that you don't ask because you feel dumb asking it never ever feel that way people please ask all the questions y'all all the questions because we were all there once by the way for those of you who didn't catch the last episode my daughter has just been welcomed as of last week into the mill spouse club yes i know you're surprised i have a daughter old enough to marry in the military but then again also you're not because many of us were her age who is 22 by the way so she's actually late in the game um she's questions these questions are all going to be like in her head and yeah she has the resource but who listens to their mother nobody i'm going to be pointing her to megan that's what i'm going to be doing i'm going to be pointing her to people like you people who just watch this episode and can be like let me break some rags down for you so yeah. remember that it's all for the future okay so and again, you guys are great with these engagement. You're very engaging. I'm loving these questions and we're definitely gonna be getting to them. 
I would like to switch here because I really love Megan's question. She made these locations specific to where we actually are right now. Right now, I'm in Virginia, right outside Quantico, shout out. Right now, she's in the sticks of Texas, uh, Texarkana, shout out, if anybody's watching or even knows what the internet is. Love you all. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's say I'm moving from here in Virginia over to Texas, over to your neck of the woods, okay? How do I find out how many travel days that we are authorized for? And and also, do we get do we get paid for each travel day authorized? All right, so the first place you're going to go to is the uh, DTMO, the Defense Travel Management Office. And we've got the link, if you guys scroll up in your comments, you'll see the links to all these regulations posted there. Um, so you go to the DTMO site. So the DTMO site will tell you how many travel days you're authorized for where you're going to um, and from. So the first thing you need to know about how many travel days you're authorized, it is 350 miles per day. Um, and some of us go more than that, some go a little less, but it's averaged 350 miles per day. Now take that last day, you know, the last little bit, say it's 150 miles. If once you divide everything by 350, you have 150 miles to go, you get an additional travel day for that 150 miles. Say that last travel day, it comes out to be 32 miles. Unfortunately, you are not getting an extra travel day. So if it's above 51 miles or more, you get that additional travel day. If it's less, you don't get an additional travel day. Um, but average about 350 miles per day will tell you how many travel days you're authorized. Now, your per diem that you get for your travel days covers like meals and lodging. You only get paid for each day that you utilize up to your allotted authorized days. So say you're authorized seven days and you do the drive in five days, you're only gonna be paid for five days. If you're authorized seven days and you decide to take your time and it takes you 10 days to get there, you're only being paid for seven. Okay, all right. I know you guys are all thinking it. I know you guys are all thinking it. Let's go ahead and math here, but only this. Okay. Let's say you're authorized five days. Mm-hmm. And you decide to just rally and drive straight through, no sleep, switching off between the two spouses, right? Don't do that, folks. It's miserable. Don't do it. Don't do it. But let's say we need a freaking vacation, okay? Because COVID, the end. Um, let's say I want to kind of make a pit stop. And it is en route. It is en route. And we plan it legit. Nobody's going to jail for fraud. <laughs> But if we utilize our time in a different manner, if they have no idea that we're driving straight through, but decide to take our time, maybe the last leg, because we want to see something cool. Is that something that we can do? Um, you can. Um, yeah, you, you can. Like you got a friend that's along your route and you want to stop and see them for a day and it takes you an additional day to get there. As long as you are within your authorized travel days, uh, you'll be paid the per diem for it. Um, but if you go over your authorized travel days, you're not. Um, but again, if you're authorized those five days and you still get there in three days, you're only going to be paid for the three. So it's kind of, you're paid with what, what you use up to your allotted amount. So this is where planning, yeah. <laughs> planning, because we have plans A through Z and then some, this is where planning would actually pay off for us for once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely plan. Look at your route. Um, see what it is. This is one of those things, again, if you have children, um, you know, I know so, some kids do really great in the car. Some kids do not do really great in the car. So if you have to break it up and everything, take a look along your route. See what kind of fun, cool things there is that you can go stop off, see um, and whatnot to kind of break it up a little bit. Um, you know, if you're authorized the eight travel days, you know, you could do it in five to just get there. But you maybe don't want to have to just rush down the road every day. You want to give your kids, you know, a moment to breathe in some fresh air in the middle of Wyoming or whatever it is, you know, take a look and see what there is to do. Stop for a night, you know, let them do something and then continue on. Awesome. So I guess there is a silver lining. Okay. So the next question actually kind of falls in line with something that someone asked. I saw it like towards the beginning. Hold on. Let me see. Okay. Um, about weight changing. 
It was. It's so wait way to remember. And perhaps it's one of those whoever finds it first. I'm letting you okay. It. All right. <laughs> okay, I found it. Okay. And and it might be because we're about to talk about weight. All right. So for people PCSing Oconus, I haven't been able to find a straight answer as to weight limit for UAB in order for it to go by plane and not by boat. Is this information located anywhere? This isn't the one that I was looking for, but can you answer Maricela's question? Shout out, girl. Yep. Check on move.mil. So generally, if a shipment is under a thousand pounds, it can be flown. If it is over a thousand pounds, it goes by boat. Um, my rule of thumb is if you're able to make your UAB be closer to 800 pounds, then you will for sure, uh, for sure, most likely be able to secure a plane spot to get it there quicker. Um, but those weight those shipments that are closer to a thousand pounds at a thousand or over will probably go by boat okay but move dot mill um we'll have that information for you move to the dot to the mill boom yeah. okay thank you maricela okay here's the question actually found it shout out marianne why did i get an email that my weight changed so it could be for any number of reasons. Um, not knowing your specific situation, if you were within uh, plus or minus 10% of your weight allotment, they automatically do a reway. Um, if you are over your weight when they did the initial weight, they will do a reway. Um, sometimes it could be that, you know, the transportation offices, the government has been doing their due diligence watching and maybe that TSP has had some shady weight tickets that they've put in. And so now they're doing some reweights on all of those shipments. Um, sometimes that happens. Uh, you know, they could have, you know, flagged your shipment to have it reweighed if there was an issue with that specific TSP. Um, now I will say that when they do a reway and you get an email that your weight changed, there are two things to keep in mind. The government, the DOD will always use the lesser weight. So if they weighed your shipment at the beginning and it was 12,000 pounds and they reweigh it now and it's 15,000 and that 15,000 makes you overweight. Don't worry about it. They will use the 12,000 pounds for your shipment. Uh, additionally, those emails, if you look closely at the bottom of them, there's a little note that says that that weight does not include your packing material deduction or your pro gear deduction. Um, and that is because your TSP is not allowed to take that number off. So your TSP inputs the weight from the weight tickets into DPS. It auto generates um, that email to you. Your local transportation office will be the one that will review the weight tickets and they will remove the 10% for your packing material and the up to uh, 2000 for your pro gear and the up to 500 for your spouse pro gear. So if that 12,000 pounds still made you overweight kind of deal, don't worry about it. Your packing material and your pro gear has not been deducted yet. No, is that because, because I think I just deduced some stuff in my mind, like, you know, like Sherlock Holmes here. Is that because the government needs to pay the transporters, the transportation service provider, they need to pay them regardless if it's pro gear. That's not the, that's not the mover's problem. That's the, that's the government's problem. So they're saying, okay, here's your legit weight based on our stuff based on what we're getting paid. And then the military, the, the DOD side comes back and says, okay, you don't have to worry about this part or this part or this part that would otherwise be charged against you. Correct. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the government pays off of the total weight, um, which is why that, that TSP does not deduct those weights yet. They input it into DPS as it is, and your local office deducts those weights. Okay. So since we're on the weight subject, um, we hear a lot about, about shipments being overweight or close to it, if you will. And then those emails from DPS with the weight can, I mean, obviously, no, there's no, I, we understand why Marianne would freak, freak out a little bit, right? Um, so where can we find the actual information about that reweight process and the rights that we have that you spoke about? Yeah, so the place you're going to look at is this right here, the DTR part four appendix B, page 11 is where you're gonna go to find out um, everything you need to know about you know that weighing and the reweighing. And I see a question down here from Mary about requesting a reweigh. You request it through two places, one through your move coordinator, 
let them know that you want to reway so that way they can be able to notify the driver and the delivery crew that a reway wants to be done. With a reway, you do have the rights to be present for it. So you can be there at the scale to watch them reway your uh, shipment. And they can also let your local uh, transportation office know as well that you have a shipment coming in. Um, so that way they can be tracking it and to know that it needs a reway as well. If you want a reway, you cannot accept your shipment. Um, once your shipment is delivered, no reway can be performed and you'll have to accept um, whatever weight is given. Yeah. And okay, so I think I know the answer to this one because trust me, I've been there, Angela. What about house hunting? If you go to the next duty station early and then return back to the current duty station for, you know, to do the actual move, is that house hunting trip counted to the to the the travel time allowed and if i'm not mistaken the answer is typically almost always absolutely not correct unfortunately it is not counted towards your travel time of actually moving. so your house hunting trip is usually just uncharged leave that you have to go and find a house but that house hunting trip none of those regular pcs entitlements count for that and that is unfortunate. Um, for example, you know, when we got orders to go from Camp Lejeune, shout out North Carolina, all the way to Kaneohebe, Hawaii. Yeah, right. Awesome. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to take a house hunting trip out there? We knew we were going to live on base, but I mean, why not? It got free leave. So wouldn't the government pay for us? Yeah. Hard no, which totally blows. That is a barrier that we currently face as military families, oftentimes we are not, we, whether we can't afford it or don't have time to take off work or just don't have the ability to go check out the area that we're going to be moving and find a place to live. A lot of times we just have to do that remotely. Um, is it difficult? Absolutely. Is it an issue? Sure. But I'm just going to say I work for PCS grades. We exist because this is actually an issue, not saying that we don't want it corrected, but we concentrate on those must solve issues. And so like, if you can't get from your base where you're at now to California, where you're going, and you need to look at the base housing there, you need to understand what people think about it out there, you need to vet the area, you can do that on pcsgrades.com. Like literally read reviews by people who are living there where you're going right now. Yeah. Like literally check it out after this. And the area guides on PCS grades too. So go check the area guides to know about the area and then check the reviews for the neighborhoods, put it all together and you'll have a good idea of what's going on there. Yeah. It's a heads up. I wish I had last move, move mm -hmm. before that. Like literally that reason alone is why I work here as a military spouse. I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. People need to know about this because I wish I had it. Um, okay. So here's the thing. Some families experience their, you know, their shipments being late and then um, they're authorized an inconvenience claim. So what is covered? What all is covered in this inconvenience claim and where do I find that information? Okay, so you're going to find information on your inconvenience claim. There are two places. The first one I'm going to throw up here for you is the DTR Part 4 Appendix B, pages 12 to 15 cover it. Additionally, if you get onto move.mil at the very top of their website, there's like a green box, and there'll be a, um, a link there that says inconvenience claim fact sheet. So you can click on that as well, and it lays it out in a very pretty picture everything you need to know. So basically your inconvenience claim is going to be like if they can't uh, deliver your shipment on time for some reason that's within their control, you could be eligible for an inconvenience claim. There are two ways that the inconvenience claim can be paid. The first one is the per diem, the meals and incidental per diem rate only for the service member only for up to seven days. Now this is a great option and you don't have to save receipts for it. So this is a great option. If you are one of those families that planned a house camp anyway, you have kids, you have pets, being in a small hotel just is not an enjoyable experience. Like you'd rather have the space in house camp. That's a great option for you to take. Um, if you are not a house camper and you're planning on having your stuff and you didn't prepare for having to camp in your house, there is the second option for payment, which is where you purchase items off of their approved list and you save your receipts and submit those for reimbursement. Now, I want to say these are essential items we're talking about. So you can get like an air mattress per person, a sheet set 
per air mattress, a towel set per person. Um, and we're talking like name brand type of things. So don't go expecting that you're going to get your $80 memory foam gel infused cooling pillow, you know, reimbursed for you. Um, they're going to reimburse the, the $5 standard more store brand name pillow. Um, and so it's a very important to understand that piece to it. I've seen some families pretty shocked that they weren't getting their $80 memory foam pillow reimbursed. Um, but you can file for an inconvenience claim. Now, again, this is stuff that is within the TSP's control. Like if they just overbooked themselves um, sort of deal, it's not your issue. They should owe you an inconvenience claim. Um, if it is an issue, the shipment is delayed because of something out of their control. Say your shipment's coming from Oconus, there is a port strike, so there's nobody working at the port. That's out of their control. If there's a natural disaster where we've seen some issues where shipments were delayed because there was a hurricane coming in, um, or there might have been a wildfire, and so the TSP is just like, hey, we need to delay this because we don't want to be unloading your shipment in the middle of the hurricane coming through and you're probably going to be evacuating anyway um, it's out of their control they can't control the hurricane coming towards your area so unfortunately those instances where it's considered an act of god um, out of their control is not eligible for an inconvenience claim but if you go to page 12 to 15 it lays it all out there for you exactly what it is you need to know got you um i just got to throw this out there because i think it's hilarious gina <laughs> I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not, sweet. House camping is such a thrill. Said no military spouse ever. Um, unless I you're say, this, Gina, and you are super po positive and moto. <laughs> listen, I want to say after you've spent like two weeks in a hotel, like getting into your house and not having your children, like the only place for them to sit is like on you or next to you. Like house camping feels like a vacation sometimes. Cause you're just like, we have space and I can go put your air mattress in another room and I can close that door. It can be, sometimes it can feel glorious. Yep. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question for, for that we pre-prepared for everyone. Um, and then we're definitely going to get to yours because you guys got a ton. You're on fire. And again, if you know somebody who is PCSing soon or heck just needs to know what these regulations look like and needs them broken down like this girl, please, tag them in the comments and say you could totally use this like the the information is useless up in here unless we share it right um okay there are always going to be those questions about claims liability um and i just want to insert and pause here this is one of the reasons why both megan and myself drive home we try to drive it home as much as possible do not under any circumstances cancel your renter's insurance before you pcs wait on that just a second because Sometimes Murphy happens and you just want to have that extra level of protection. But in this particular instance, there are questions about claims liability and what exactly it is that they cover. So talk to me about that liability and then also that replacement versus repair thing. Okay. So first I want to tell you where to find it at and you're going to find it right here. The claims liability business rules on page four is where it starts. So it's important to understand that um, the liability is $6 per pound up to $75,000. So if for instance, your shipment is only 10,000 pounds at $6 per pound, your shipment liability maxes out, caps out at $60,000. Um, if you have a catastrophic loss, that $60,000 may not replace what you have in your home, which is why it's important to keep your runner's insurance or to have a personal property insurance policy of some sort in place. So that way the TSP pays out to their max liability, anything that they don't cover, then you turn around and you file with your private insurance. Um, it's important to understand if you're, if it costs $150,000 to replace everything in your home, you're unfortunately not going to get that from the moving company, um, which is why you need to have your private insurance in play there. Um, the other part of the question was about uh, replacement versus repair. So the company, the TSP, is able to determine if they want to repair the item or replace the item. That is their call to make. If they want to repair the item, 
It is your choice whether you want them to coordinate the repair with a repair form with a repair firm, or if you want them to pay you the repair amount. Um, so say it's four hundred dollars to fix your table. You can say, "Hey, I would like for you to coordinate the repair for this table." Um, if you are one of those people where you're just done and you're over and you'd rather just be done with the company and handle things yourself, you can say, "Just pay me the four hundred dollars. I'll go handle the repair myself." So they get to choose repair or replace. You get to choose if they choose repair, you get to choose if you want it to be repaired or if you want to receive the repair cost. Now, flip side, replacement. If they choose replacement, you get two options here as well. You can ask them to go ahead and replace the item where you can say, hey, can you just you know go ahead and Amazon that item to me, send me the email, the confirmation so I know it's coming um, sort of deal. So that way, and this is great because you cannot claim tax and shipping up front. They can pay up to $10 tax and shipping. Say, you know, tax is like 20 bucks, depending where you live. Shipping, for whatever reasons, like another 20 bucks, you know, you're out $40, $50 on that. Sometimes it's more, depending on the item and where you're located at. Asking them to go ahead and just purchase the item, especially, you know, we agree that this is the same item. We agree that, you know, it needs to be replaced with this. Um, and whatnot, go ahead and ask them to, to just order it and send you the confirmation that it was ordered because then you don't have to go back and ask um, for the tax and, and shipping cost on it. Um, but you have that choice where you can ask them to just go ahead and purchase it for you or they can give you the repair cost or the, the replacement cost for it. So say that table, it's $800 to replace it. You can ask them, you know, here's the same table link. Please just go ahead and order it for me. Or you can say, you know, I'll take care of it myself. Just pay me the $800. Now, important thing to know with the claim timeline, if, if they choose replacement and they pay you full replacement value for it, they do have a right to their salvage rights um, where they can come and pick up that item and take it um, because they paid you full replacement value for it. So it's the assumption that you're going to replace it. Um, okay, question. Yeah. Hands, they broke my bed. Like yep. It wasn't me this time. They broke my bed. They paid me the full replacement value. They are going, if they really just wanted to just Murphy us, mm -hmm. they could say, you know what? We know you broke your bed. We broke your bed and we paid you for it, but we want the lumber. Because, you know, that's going for a pretty penny right now. So we want that. Yep. They, they can, can totally that. come and do it. It's within, it's part of that, that claim liability business rules within their rights that they can exercise their salvage rights. So anything that they pay full replacement value for, they can exercise their salvage rights to it because they paid for it. Um, it's under the assumption they paid you for your bed. It's under the assumption that you're going to get a new bed so they can take that bed um, sort of deal. So it's, it's one of those things to just be cautious of if you... So you have an antique dresser that was your grandma's and you want to keep the antique dresser, but it's, you know, very damaged, but it still has sentimental value to it. They pay you the full replacement value for it because um, you had that appraisal or whatever it may be. They can come and take that dresser. Um, if you want to keep that dresser, you don't want them to, to take it, then they are allowed at that point allowed to offer you less than full replacement value because you are denying them their salvage rights. So they have that ability to pay you less in that instance. Um, but if you're okay with them taking the table, taking the bed, taking the dress or whatever the item is, um, if they pay you full replacement value for it, they can exercise their salvage rights to it. Okay, and just for the record, Courtney, shout out, Courtney, mm -hmm. if you have them repair and then you aren't satisfied with said repair. So you don't sign off on it. You let your move coordinator and claims adjuster know that you're not satisfied with the work that was done and they can either go back and continue to try to repair it to um, your satisfaction or at that point, you know, say it's something that you really wanted replaced because you knew it couldn't be repaired right. Um, you know, you can go back and negotiate having replacement value. Um, you know, you can tell them that this wasn't repaired to make it still functional or repaired to make it the condition it was prior to moving. Um, you know, so you can go back and say either needs to continue to be repaired by somebody better or, you know, you can negotiate uh, the replacement value for it as well. Okay. So. And Angela, um, so I'm going through all of these questions. What about laser printer ink still in original boxes? My husband bought extra when he found out, you know, some because we had a, when he found some because he had a hard time finding our ink and it was looking like we might have them with my oldest 
school ending in a few days. She's remote learning. So what about laser printer ink? Can they keep that? If it's not, if it's in the box, original box, not undone, can they keep it? it I will say maybe. It's going to be company dependent. If it's in the box, unopened, it should be okay. Um, but if you have ink in your printer, you should remove it from your printer. Okay. Um, sorry. Maricela, again, girlfriend on fire shout out. We never had luck getting it through to the TSP immediately. What advice do you have in a situation where you're having issues with the movers and not hearing back from the TSP in a timely manner? Million dollar question, by the way, Maricela. Totally normal. Got you. So you call your local transportation office. Um, they're there to help you as well. Um, there, there are several places you can go. So your, your move coordinator should always be the first place you go to because they're the ones that handle any issues between what's going on in your move and uh, the companies that are hired to, to do the service. If you can't get a hold of them, turn to your local transportation office. Um, they're there. They should be able to send somebody to help. For some reason, you can't get a hold of them either. Um, get on to move.mil under that customer service tab. You can input your location and it gives you uh, the numbers and contact info to the PIPSO or GYPSO office. That is um, like the next level higher than your local transportation office. You can call them um, for assistance as well. Each of the services, again, on move.mil under the uh, customer service tab is um, uh, numbers to each of the services specific help desk, um, you know, call centers where you can call and talk to them as well. And then there's the transcom hotline number that's listed on that same page um, as well that you can reach out to. By the way, everything she just said, we are going to be dropping in the comments. So we're going to take get, get the link that takes you directly to all you got to do is put in your location so that you can find out who your um, Point of contact would be we will also drop the trans um the, the hotline the again i can't word today what it's is happening um, the hotline. Wednesday that feels like a monday because it's been raining non-stop in podunk for real and by the way um shout out to anybody here viewing from texas the fact that you have internet and are still watching or i'd be scared hiding under my bed not a fan of all the storms unless it's just the light rain where you can like enjoy it right like yeah so we had some tornado warnings last night that was quite interesting of course you did <laughs> thanks murphy um okay um let's see i'm looking here through through all of your questions i'm super impressed with everyone please know that if you refer somebody here and they end up watching the replay we will get to their questions as well um it looks as though, let's see. I've got a question for you, MJ, Miss PCS Grades here from Destin. So home stuff, do y'all just stateside area guides or do we have some overseas ones as well? Am so, I putting you on the spot? Did I just stump MJ? Do I win the prize? Okay, you win zero. You win nothing. You can suck it. I love you, Megan. <laughs> and yeah, because we are that close. We're friends outside of this, by the way. Um, no, for the record, okay, so um, do you guys do stateside or do you do overseas as well? Here's the gist. We have information about OCONUS moves on PCSGrades.com. You can go in there and look at, you know, what is it going to, one of our most successful articles, two of them, you know, shipping your POV, your privately owned vehicle overseas. Another one is unaccompanied orders. Okay. So yeah, that thing that rocks our world, whether it's our decision or the military's, we have information on that as well. When it comes to um, resources for our OCONUS people, when it comes to area guides, you know, we are working on those OCONUS area guides. We need the information. We are our home base, our headquarters for PCS grades, what, what, is in San Antonio, Texas. Yes. But we have reviews that have been left and area guides that have been written by military spouses like you all over the country at nearly every installation. Okay. Those, uh, we are building out our OCONUS area. I doubt my boss is going to send me to Japan to write an area guide. So if you know somebody who is currently stationed in Japan, we would like more information from them on what it's like to live in Japan. Now, when it comes to the review side of things, we do not yet have our OCONUS housing reviews. 
yet. We are building as we go. You can leave a review. It will not be yet public as we work through some things. We do need that information for the people who are moving overseas. When it comes to moving overseas, the vast majority of us must live aboard the installation because depending on where you go, you probably want to. However, there are some areas where you can live out in the economy and we are working on content to help you navigate what that might look like. Um, but for right now, we are exploding stateside. So if you go online right now and if you go to PCS grades and you look up your area guide, if you feel like there's something that needs to be added, if you feel like something might need to be corrected because you know, something different, something um, there was renovations or there was a, a boom, if you will, in that area or they have new restaurants in that area or something to that effect that you feel is pertinent to the people who are going to be moving to your area, let us know. Like, I will absolutely throw my email address in the comments. Let us know because you are the eyes and ears. PCS Grades is 100% entirely crowdsourced through our military and veteran community. It is for us and by us because military families take care of one another. I trust what you have to say because you are living my life. So whether it's reading an area guide to the place that I'm going to be moving to or reading a housing review in the neighborhood that I'm looking at, I'm going to trust what you say because you are living my life. Um, and that is what PCS Grades is about. So stand by on the Ocona stuff and um, but definitely hit us up with some more information. I will be dropping my email in the links. In the, in the comment section. So thank you for that. So I'm just going to agree with Sarah here. I think we should totally go, <laughs> to, you know, first hand uh, research onto some Oconus locations. You know, I'm happy to go ahead and, and take London, England, um, you know, for our services, service members over there that need to know what to do. Um, <laughs> Sarah, you're there. so funny. You're yeah. so funny. So cute. So funny. I so second. Cute. I agree. Motion. Let's go. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, so perhaps stand by. Maybe you will be the straw that breaks the camel's back, Sarah. And in which case, I will owe you a souvenir if that's the case. <laughs> and then before we wrap yes. up, I wanted to share this last thing too from Krista. Um, Krista is our good friend over at AER Army Emergency Relief, um, but a good reminder that, you know, we have our aid societies. Each branch has their aid society that can help with so much regarding PCSing um, and those expenses, unexpected expenses that we may have during the process. You know, your car breaks down en route and, you know, suddenly there's an expense that you weren't planning for and now you're, um, you know, struggling at the other end. There is so much that our service Soci aid societies can can help our, our service members through and help them with. And so if you're in that situation, as you go into peak season, you realize your PCS fund is a little bit shorter than what it needs to be. Um, you know, are you something crazy happens unexpectedly? Do not be afraid to reach out to our aid societies for assistance. They give um, either it's either a 0% interest loan, a grant or a combination of the two to help get you where you need to go. Um, and they help you with other resources such as budgeting and planning to help make sure you're you're on your feet and you're good to go and you're not struggling in the wind. So don't forget about them. They're amazing folks and, and, and the societies are here for all of us. You're muted. It's Wednesday, you're muted. <laughs> Why she's Mother not talking Potter. anymore. Yeah, so happy Wednesday. Thanks, Murphy. I swear I was trying to avoid it. Uh, apparently, it just didn't happen. But we love our aid societies, and we've had them on in the past, and we do plan on having them again in the future here shortly. Um, did you happen to see any other saved rounds? Just for the record, if we we, we are at 113, probably one of our longest webinars, and we're going to go ahead and hit it and quit it with that uh, drawing because we got some pretty special stuff from Hope Design here. Um, we are going to absolutely 100% get back to each of your questions after the after we're done here, we will we will get to yours like me and or Megan. Um, in the meantime, while Stacy is going ahead and collecting those names for us, for everyone who turned out and really just just went to town, um, let me see. Um, I know you hear me typing away. Aren't I a loud loud typer, everyone? Uh, I was like, if you missed any questions, when we get done, y'all, I'll go back through all of the comments when they stop scrolling on me um, 
And I will, if there's anything that we missed, I'll be happy, happy to answer, um, you know, and Abs see what we missed. So Mary recognizes I almost did it without the mute all the way to the end without the mute. Mary, thank you for at least recognizing progress. <laughs> if we would have ended on time, she would have made it. But we enjoy talking and answering questions and having shenanigans. And so because of that, yeah. Yeah. So let me show you while, while Stacy is sending me those names. Um, let me show you what it is that we are going to be giving away today. Um, so recently, you know, our friends over at Hope Design Limited now have restocked their um, their uh, one of their signature items, which is really, really cool. And I'm going to show you right now. This is their signature military button necklaces. OK, so whomever wins today, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. OK, so whomever wins today. Um, We'll go ahead and message the PCS Grades Facebook page with not only your email address, but also the branch of service in which you are affiliated with. And you will get one of these bad boys, which, by the way, these are really, really hot <laughs> um, and everybody needs slash wants one. Um, I've given them as gifts in the past to personal friends. And um, I even know of a celebrity who is uh, kind of rocking one of her Marine Corps buttons. So they are. Beautiful. I have one. They're absolutely gorgeous, everybody. And um, yes. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And um, while I get those names plugged in, because Lord knows y'all don't want to see the inside of MJ's brain. It has been a month. Of course, it's been a month. It's, it's, it's military appreciation month. All right. Um, Megan. Yes. I am plugging it, doggone it. I'm plugging in the names for real this time. For real. As um, opposed to pretend last time. You what? As opposed to pretend plugging them in last time. Yeah. Supposed to. Okay. All right. I am now for real, legit, sharing my screen for the final. Okay. Because we're just giving away one of these. And next week we'll be we'll be giving away two. Of these exact same things so make sure that you share with your friends come on share screen yeah. you gotta hit the button megan send me coffee <laughs> got it right here false okay here we go yeah. we got a nice little wheel going on here y'all so many here we go the winner of our hope design limited service button necklace pretend you hear drum drum roll in your head Someday we'll have music, y'all. Is none other than Destin Jenkins. Congratulations, Destin. Congratulations. I know that you're looking at uh looking up into the uh the whole PCS sphere here pretty soon. And I know you're gonna be one of our avid watchers. Um go ahead to the PCS grades page, hit us up with your email address. I'm pretty sure I have your information. Email address, service branch, so that we can get you. Um, all right, let me stop sharing so that we can get outside of my brain. Okay. All right, everybody. We really appreciate you hitting this up. I know it was a lot. You guys brought awesome questions that is going to help other people who are not only just hitting the replay, but also military families who are walking straight into this through baptism by fire. Your questions are from people who are living this life. Your questions that you asked and the answers that we provided are ultimately going to help those other military families just like yours. So, Megan, until next week. This too shall PCS.